Alongside melting glaciers, marine oil spills and inundated islands, large-scale monocrop plantations are emblematic of an era characterized by the unprecedented scale and effects of human activity on the planet. Indeed, the magnitude and impacts of plantations have led some scholars to informally coin the current epoch as the Plantationocene, a spatiotemporal formation that is rooted in racialized forms of colonialism and that entails the mass substitution of multi-species forests with extractive and industrial monocrops to the detriment of both human and non-human organisms that forests stain. Within the agribusiness nexus, the palm oil sector is particularly notorious for its destructive environmental impacts. Palm oil is one of just four commodities, driving the majority of tropical deforestation and the second largest driver of global warming after beef production. Oil palm plantations dramatically reduce biodiversity and damage the habitats of endangered species. The adverse consequences of oil palm expansion on the livelihoods and land rights of indigenous peoples and other rural communities have also been extensively documented. Yet despite widespread controversy over their environmental and social effects, oil palm plantations continue to spread across the tropical belt, driven by economic development imperatives, renewable energy policies and a growing global population. Both a source of food and fuel, Palm oil remains the cheapest and most versatile vegetable oil on the market and is present in over half of all packaged goods in the world today. Over the last decade, indigenous Marind communities in the Indonesian-controlled region of West Papua, where I have been conducting ethnographic fieldwork since 2013, have seen some 2 million hectares of their customary lands targeted for oil palm development. In this presentation, I will examine how indigenous Marind theorize the spatiotemporal formation that is the Plantationocene. In particular, I will examine how their theories revolve around the being of oil palm itself, an introduced cash crop that is conceptualized by Marind as both tree and person, assailant and victim, and stranger and kin. This vegetal being's ontology further multiplies in moral, political and affective terms across its material manifestations as plant, part and product, from individual stand to monocrop plantation and from seedling to packaged oil. I'll then examine how Marind strategically foreground or background different facets of oil palms reality in the context of their negotiations with state and corporate actors. Essentializing the complex and multiple reality of oil palm is necessary for indigenous activism to succeed. But these essentializations can also backfire unintentionally on the indigenous activists who deploy them. I'll close the talk by highlighting the theoretical import of indigenous modes of analysis for thinking about plantations as extractive assemblages and about more than human agency in the Anthropocene. Indigenous Marind in the Upper Bian region of Merauke, West Papua, where I undertook my fieldwork, number around 600 families and rely primarily on the forest for their subsistence and livelihoods. Each Marind clan is related to particular plant and animal species, whom they refer to as grandparents or siblings, and with whom they share common descent from ancestral spirits, or Dema. Just as far as plants and animals are considered by Marind to be sentient and agentive persons, so too oil palm, the introduced cash crop now taking over Marind forests, is conceived by villagers as a consequential and animate being. Yet unlike forest species that know how to live symbiotically with each other and with humans, oil palm is widely characterized by Marind as a destructive, greedy and foreign plant being. This entity, as one village elder put it, devours the land and drinks up the rivers. Its insatiable appetite for resources obliterates the ecologies necessary for Marind and their non-human kin to thrive. Oil palm's unstoppable proliferation even transforms the climate, causing droughts, heat waves and untimely rainfall. For these reasons, many Marind refer to oil palm as an assailant, a killer and an enemy of the forest who, alongside the Indonesian state, settlers and soldiers, perpetuates the colonization of West Papua in a vegetal guise. The plant is also often said to be a troublemaker, 
because its arrival has triggered unprecedented conflict among Marin clans over land rights, compensation and contracts. As Marin land rights activist Pius explained, Marin once stood united with each other and with the forest. But now Marin are divided. Some are for plantations, others are against them. Since all palm arrived, peace in the forest has given way to conflict in the plantations. And for this, all palm is to blame. And yet, the blame that Marin placed on all palm is only part of the story. As Cosmas, a young Marin man who had recently taken up employment as a plantation labourer, explained, all palm is greedy and selfish for sure. But over time, I have come to realise that this is not the whole story. All palm is also a victim. All palm comes from a faraway place, but all palm is also our kin. All palm is a tree of many lives. For Cosmas, then, all palm is a destructive assailant, but not only. The cash crop obliterates the forest life world, and yet it too is a victim, in Cosmas's words, because every stage of its life as capital is determined by corporate actors. For instance, Marin plantation and mill workers often noted that all palm's development, form and uses, from seedling to commodity, were subject to countless biological and technological manipulations in biotech labs, plantations, refineries and manufacturing plants. Oil palm is artificially bred through controlled pollination and its yield boosted with a range of chemical fertilizers to achieve corporate targets of production. The cash crop's own lucrative wetness, palm oil, is extracted from its fruit through high heat, high pressure processes of mechanical extraction. Care enacted towards oil palm is entirely conditional upon the profit that it can generate. Seedlings that do not achieve yield targets are systematically culled, whilst unproductive or diseased stands are pulverized by trunk shredders in a matter of minutes. Other Marin villagers spoke of oil palm feeling lonely in the monocrop plantations where it is forced to grow among its own kind and in a foreign land, rather than in reciprocal relation with plants and animals on its native West African soils. For instance, Marin women expressed pity towards oil palm seeds that germinate in sanitized plastic bags and airtight containers rather than in their native and natural ecologies. Perpetua, a young Marin woman, spoke of the seas having been displaced by the millions from their home environments and separated from their kin. She then described with sorrow how oil palm fruit are ripped from their parents every 10 to 15 days during harvesting and then brutally flung into overloaded trucks like corpses for transport to the mill. What happens to oil palm's fruit in the mill is unknown. People see only dark smoke rising from its chimneys, trucks to and froing, and finally containers filled with canisters of deep red crude palm oil, which some of my companions called oil palm blood. Oil palm's plant being also varies across scale and across substance, giving rise to different emotional responses among Marind. When encountering palms as individual stands, for instance, curiosity tends to predominate. In the same way that Marin read the pasts and relations of the forest organisms through tactile engagements with their morphologies in the forest, so too people will often stop when travelling along or inside plantations to scrutinise and touch all palm stands at length, their bark, fronds and fruit, in an attempt, as they say, to know its story. Large-scale monocrop concessions as collectives, on the other hand, produce fear and anger among those who behold or enter them. The seemingly relentless expansion of these biocapitalist formations conjures from many Marind the political occupation and ongoing invasion of the West Papuan territory by Indonesian settlers, military forces and corporations. Gendered, generational and professional differences within Marind communities further shape the prevalence of certain depictions of oil palm over others. For instance, the notion of oil palm as a vulnerable victim was most common amongst Marind women, who often decried the violent uprooting and wrenching of oil palm seeds and fruit, or what they called oil palm children, from their native homes and parent palms. In contrast, the characterization of oil palm as a foreign and invasive plant being was particularly prevalent amongst male village elders who have lived through the forceful incorporation of West Papua into Indonesia, the beginnings of large-scale resource extraction and the influx of non-Papuan settlers into the region.
Meanwhile, characterizations of oil palm as a kin of sorts were most common amongst individuals who now work within plantations as fresh fruit harvesters and pesticide sprayers. These individuals interact on a daily basis with oil palm and support its healthy maturation through their various practical labors. The material and semiotic relations they have come to cultivate with the plant thus differ from those of Marind who do not work in the plantation sector and who therefore know oil palm only through its destructive effects. Finally, the shifting ontology of oil palm as subject come object of violence is compounded by uncanny similarities that Marind identify between this introduced cash crop and the native sago palm, which is the source of Marind's staple starch, sago flower, and a plant of central significance in Marind cosmology. For instance, some villagers noted morphological resemblances between oil palm and sago palm and described them as cousins or siblings of the same family. Others compared the fertile wetness of sago pith to the lucrative wetness of oil palm as an oil producing plant. Sago, a young Marind woman Evelina reflected, connects Marind to other sago eating communities or sago people across New Guinea. But Evelina was quick to add that palm oil in the processed food that Marind now increasingly consume, like instant noodles, biscuits and ketchup, also incorporates them within transnational communities of palm oil consumers across Indonesia, Southeast Asia and the world. The scientific name of oil palm itself, Elaeus guineensis, or the olive of Guinea, was particularly intriguing to villagers who had learned during workshops hosted by oil palm corporations that the plant is native to countries that bear the same name as their home island. This discovery prompted widespread speculation amongst villagers over the possibility of shared origins and kinships between themselves as inhabitants of New Guinea and the distant but potentially related plants and peoples of African Guinea and Guinea-Bissau. Oil palm then from our end is a concomitantly known, unknown and imagined object of wonder, whose relationship to Marind is mediated by complex material semiotic processes. The plant's radically simplified ecology produces a contrastingly heterogeneous ecology of affects among Marind that is replete with fear, pity, resentment and curiosity. Such intensified expressions or feelings of wonder speak to a radical reconfiguration of more than human realities and relations in the colliding worlds of monocrop plantation and multi-species forest. At the same time, wonder discourses surrounding oral palm create ontological openings by making space for compassion, care and curiosity alongside resentment and dread towards this uninvited and proliferated plant being. Recent events and new knowledge acquired by Marind from corporations, NGOs and anthropologists play an ongoing and transformative role in fleshing out the shifting onto epistemic contours of all palms contested reality. Indeed, Marind, whom I worked with, rarely stick to any single account in describing oil palm. Instead, they shift constantly and conceptually between its different facets. Oil palm's ontology, then, is not reducible to an either-or between different states of being. Rather, it takes the form of a series of apposite yet accretive ands. At once assailant and victim, plant and person, foreigner and kin, Oil palm, to return to Cosmas' words, is a tree of many lives. The dispersed reality of oil palm plays out in conflicting ways in the context of its interactions with government and company representatives. For instance, positing oil palm as an antisocial person and killer being in these multi-stakeholder negotiations often backfires by reinforcing entrenched stereotypes of West Papuans as primitive and superstitious peoples in the eyes of the government and corporations. This in turn only further legitimates the developmentalist rhetoric that drives projects like oil palm plantations in the first place. The success of Marin's land rights advocacy thus depends largely on their ability to strategically underplay those facets of oil palms being that are counterproductive to their claims. Its status as a victim, kin, an object of wonder, for instance. Aspects of oil palms reality that must be left out does not make them any less real, but simply less appropriate and effective in the context of the state and corporate audiences before which they must be downplayed. 
and yet Marin does agree among themselves over what to foreground or background during land rights negotiations. For some, the deliberate omission of oil palm from these negotiations is problematic because it renders invisible a central protagonist that, for all its destructive effects, also has a stake in the making and unmaking of multi-species worlds. Conversely, however, framing oil palm as a problem ends up reinforcing stereotypes of indigenous Marind as uneduc uneducated and primitive peoples. It entrenches the notion that development, including in the form of agribusiness projects, is necessary for their emancipation from superstitious animistic beliefs. Marin land rights activists themselves are acutely aware of the politics of ontological disclosure and performance as they struggle for recognition in the face of multinational conglomerates, state agencies and international financial institutions funding the palm oil sector. Their pursuit of ecological justice entails astute negotiations and collaborations not only with oil palm, but also with the human others who constitute this industrial cash crops allies. In these complex plant human entanglements, how indigenous active activists engage in strategic self-representation before powerful and predatory audiences can profoundly determine the shape of reality itself. Let me now close with some broader reflections on the import of indigenous Marin theories for our understanding of life in the plantation scene. As I have shown in this account, Marin can see the form and effects of the plantation is seen in more than human terms within a cosmos in which the human itself emerges through its relations to other organisms. Here, oil palm constitutes a vegetal form of significant otherness that refuses to participate in pre-existing life worlds and instead appropriates the resources necessary to their survival only to sustain its own. But oil palm is also a polyvalent object of wonder and even compassion amongst those subjected to its indubitably destructive effects. Marin's desire to know oil palm's story, its origins, kin and home, can also be conceived as a form of speculative care towards a plant whose unloving impacts Marin themselves recognize may obscure the loving relations that the plant might entertain with other life forms in other places. Marin's multiply diverse characterizations of oil palm thus complicate the prevailing depiction of monocrops as impoverished realms devoid of biotic and semiotic diversity by revealing them to be animated instead by manifold heterogeneous meanings in transition and in friction. Oil palm is hypercognized in morally and politically imbued ways by different Marin individuals whose understanding of the plant's reality transforms upon the acquisition of external knowledge that is then internally interpreted and contested. At once material and symbolic in form, attributes and effects, oil palm travels and transforms across the forest and plantation worlds that it alternately undermines, reconfigures or enables. The dispersed reality of oil palm further multiplies in the context of multi-stakeholder negotiations where portraying oil palm in culturally valid ways can end up exacerbating the very conditions that indigenous advocacy seeks to overcome. The dispersed ontology of oil palm in turn invites attention to the violence enacted upon and by other than human life forms as they become incorporated in and mass corporatized within global markets and trade regimes, or what Sundar Kaushik Rajan calls lively capital. Attending to commodified life forms such as oil palm as lively but also as lethal capital allows us to explore their damaging effects upon places and peoples as unloving rather than or as well as unloved others. It highlights the violence enacted toward living capital as the unpaid labor force of the capitalist system, manipulated and exploited by humans in the production of cheap natures. It also foregrounds the diverse ways in which species become enlisted and transformed by capitalist nationalist projects, whilst also themselves shaping these human driven projects through their own sometimes unexpected forms of agency and effects. Oil palm and Merauke embodies the three coexisting aspects of lethal capital I've outlined above. On the one hand, the plant benefits from the forces of global capitalism driving its proliferation. Humans and machines have become increasingly dependent on the food and fuel that oil palm provides. And as controversial as oil palm monocropping might be, the plant remains the most optimal of all vegetal oil crops in terms of land to yield ratio. At the same time, 
the machinations of human-driven capitalism that enable oil palm to proliferate en masse at the expense of the forest and its life forms also dictates the particular ways in which this expansion takes place and at what cost to a cash crop that is cultivated only to be ultimately pulverized into profit. Orpam unleashes unrestrained violence upon the landscapes it invades and colonizes, but its own life is also subjected to regimes of violent care or the implication of care with coercion in interspecies relations. Indeed, many Marin themselves recognize that the harmful effects of agribusiness arise from oil palms entrapment within particular modes of political capitalist exploitation rather than or alongside the destructive attributes of the plant itself. In refusing to flatten oil palm to a singular or bounded ontology, Marin also refused to limit the possibilities of their own moral and effective dispositions towards it. This is, in Alexis Shotwell's term, a stance against purity and for multiplicity, one of perpetual ontic differentiation and deferral that in turn could be said to be a form of epistemic resistance to the reductionist logic of the plantation model and its colonial capitalist underpinnings. But one, what, might, what one might ask of all palm and other cash crops reality outside of their entanglements with humans Given we will never be able to access oil palm's world of vision, does our understanding of its multi-species entanglements always and ultimately take us back to the human? Addressing this question, I would argue, requires asking which human's world of vision are at play, rather than assuming a singular or homogeneous human perspective in the first place. It would require acknowledging that human worlds of vision themselves are internally complex, conflictual and transitional. Among Marind and West Papua, such worlds of vision imbue entities like Olpan with multiple contemporaneous vegetal identities, as immoral organisms, uncanny kin, and exploited victims. As a tree of many lives, Olpan's ontology also transforms in light of new information, encounters, and events, in a process of ontogenesis shaped as much by what is known as, what, as by what is out of yet unknown, already imagined, and ongoingly contested. In these interspecies entanglements, both material and speculative, the story of proliferating cash crops like old palm matter because they too have a part to play in the making and unmaking of common worlds. Many thanks for your attention. Um, I very much look forward to your questions and feedback. Please also do feel free to get in touch um, via email um, or to visit my website, www.morethanhumanworlds.com.